Ich bin der James, aber ich würde auch Englisch sprechen. Ja, it's definitely better for you when I speak out English. Um, okay, well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is James, and I work for Interlink. And the talk uh, that was called "Look, Mum, No Unit Tests" was supposed to be, uh, be about software best practices for network engineers. Um, so, in the industry that we're in, we work in networking, but software is a huge part of that. Everything is automated these days. Um, and there are people in our industry who are at one end of the scale, like hardcore devs. They just program and code stuff all day long. There are people at the other end who are just banging on the Cisco CLI all day, and they're happy as Larry. And there are some people in the, in the middle. But we all have to work together. Um, so I was originally writing a talk for the people who are kind of this end of the scale, hardcore networking, not much software experience, and want to move more into the middle. Um, But as I've been working with Interlink, so we're a new carrier, brand new carrier, building out a new global network, everything's greenfield, and we have the mix of people along this spectrum. And it became clear to me that actually also the people at the, the hardcore programming end need to learn some things about networking. So there's actually stuff, wherever you are on that spectrum, there's something you need to learn about automation. Just because you're a great programmer doesn't mean you're a great automator. Or just because you're a great networker doesn't mean you're a great automator. They're, they're, they're different things. So I hope that will become clear. Um, so I'll just quickly give a quick background about us, me and Interlink to kind of, I'm not going to give you a hard sales pitch, but just to give you a kind of um, some context as to the problems we're facing. And then hopefully you'll understand the examples I give a bit better and get something from the presentation. You can take it home and apply it to your, your scenario, right? And then I'll kind of go through these different points, things you can apply when you're working on automation. So a quick thing about us. So we want to be the first sustainable connectivity provider in the world. Um, so we're building out a global network. We're trying to make it as low power as possible. We're trying to do as much carbon offsetting as possible as we possibly can. Um, we want it to be fully automated. I'll talk more about that, obviously, in this talk about automation, shockingly. Um, we want fully transparent services. So the pricing is transparent, the operation is transparent, your service status is transparent. So we've built a portal that we see in a minute. You can go in there, the pricing is open. We don't have a, like complex pricing sheets or monthly wrap sheets that we produce. We've built a pricing engine. We can make updates to prices you see it in real time. And you're thinking, great, those are a load of buzzwords, James. Why did you just tell me all that? Because there's something that links all of those things together, and that is automation and software. So everything that the company does or that we want to be doing is relying on software and automation. So that's how we got to this problem that we need to be automating stuff, right? Not just some config on a device. It's the full stack services need to be automated, billing, invoicing, status updates, mailing lists. E everything needs to be automated. So this is the portal that we built. I'll just give you a quick demo and then I'll explain kind of some of the problems that we had along the way, right? So you can just log in, um, choose the locations you want. This is, this is just running on my laptop. Um, so I just want to get some IP transit, for example. So I can just log in, choose a location, choose the details for my transit service, a port speed I want. I want a slash 31 and a 127 or whatever. I can stick it on a VLAN. You guys, I think, all know how transit works, so nothing mind-blowing there. Um, configure your BGP session, you just pop your AS number in and we pull everything else out of PeeringDB. And you can just set a CDR and stuff and a, and a password if you want. Um, place order summary. Don't look into this too much because this is just running on my laptop. So I don't think the prices are correct or anything really. Um, it's just a demo. Um, and then you order it and you're done. And so you get this graph with no data on it because it's running on my laptop. Um, but you would have traffic usage of your service. You see a breakdown of all the things you ordered. You ordered a port, you ordered a prefix, a BGP session, setup cost, monthly billing, done. So that's kind of a, a typical scenario for us, let's say, yeah? So what are the problems with getting to this state? How do we get there and what are the problems and what are the problems that you will also have automating stuff? I'm not going to make this too specific to us. Um, so we want to auto magic everything. So does everybody, we all want everything instantly. That's pretty much the status quo for 2023. Um, but the migration to sort of automated <coughs> operations is a bit of a journey. So even though we're doing this greenfield and I've worked on many brownfield networks and always thought, God, I wish I was doing this greenfield, it would be so much easier. That is not true. So, because if you have a brownfield network and you want to automate some stuff, 
everyone thinks, ah, oh, we have processes in place. All I can do is change one tiny thing at a, at, at a time and make these small steps. Um, but there is actually a huge benefit to that because you have already decided on your IP address allocation scheme. Your host name naming scheme is done. Your DNS scheme is done. You have all the processes in place. And when you have to do everything from scratch, all of those things that you take for granted takes a really long time. So um, don't make the mistake that I did, which was thinking that automating something greenfield would somehow be easier or take less time. It's taken us nearly a year to get our first product live. And we had to, because we have to build everything. All of our internal infrastructure, our Kubernetes stack has to be built from scratch. If you work on a brownfield network, you have some VMware stuff in a cupboard already. Um, so we went through this whole journey, realized it was a bit harder than we thought. And we, so there are some good questions you can ask yourself along the way when you're automating stuff. Um, and that's what I want this talk to be about. But the spoiler is, if you've been in networking for a while, you kind of know some of these questions already you're just not thinking about them. You're thinking about networky stuff and you're not thinking about software -y stuff. So data modeling, it's really, really important to stop and take a step back and think about how will you mod model your products and services. So you'll have interfaces with IPs and VLANs and you'll have BGP sessions and AS numbers and all, all this stuff that needs to come together somehow. So a very typical way that people model this, including us, is like a sort of Lego bricks approach. Everything is like a small Lego brick so we have a port, we have a VLAN, we have a prefix, and a BGP session, and you click them all together, and that's an IP transit session. And then we want to sell IP access. That also needs a port, and maybe a VLAN, and a prefix, and a BGP session. Same Lego bricks. Easy. So many people use the kind of Lego brick approach, but you need to kind of work out what are the services you're selling, what are the bricks they're made of, which ones can be used together, and which ones can't be used together, and you kind of have to take some time to do that. And doing that is a lot of meetings, a lot of drawings, flow diagrams, and it feels like, many times it feels like a huge waste of time. But if you take the time to do it, it will save you a significant amount of time in the long run. Yeah. It's worth taking the time to, to do it once. What are you going to model? So I said you've got these Lego bricks for your ports and VLANs and IPs and VRFs and routers and whatever, whatever it is you've got. Um, but as I said earlier, when you're trying to start automating the stuff, if you try to automate everything, that's impossible. You make the small steps to get to where you want to be. That doesn't just apply to actual writing code. It also applies to what you model. So there are two ways you can model stuff, implicitly and explicitly. Explicitly is, the is, is a bit self-explanatory. So um, I want to have all my BGP sessions modeled. I've got some routers in Germany and I've got some root reflectors in Germany. All my core routers are going to have a BGP session to the root reflectors. So I can define all those BGP sessions in my sort of network config database. Yeah. But if every router is going to have a BGP session to the root reflectors, do I need to define them? The fact that they're in Germany means they will have appearing with the root reflector in Germany. So I don't really need to explicitly define it. It can just be provisioned automatically. Um, so actually, that would be imp so I can shift this implicit model of just if my router is in Germany, it needs to appear with the, the root reflectors in Germany, the nearest root reflectors. I don't need to define all those sessions. But there's a trade-off. The implicit model is extremely quick. I have less to develop, less to document, less to put in our config system, which is great for speed, but it's not so flexible. As soon as I introduce a new root reflector with a new software version, and I want to move one or two routers across to that new root reflector, if the BGP sessions aren't explicitly defined, I can't move them over. So I've traded off the flexibility for the speed of development. And so you have to think about your services, your models, your operations. What are the things that will never change? Model them implicitly. What will very likely change? Model it explicitly. And there's going to be some stuff in the middle somewhere that you're pretty much going to have like a holy war about. Um, and then where do you model it? Um, even though we've done a greenfield deployment and tried to keep our technical stack you know, small, you would still have multiple applications doing some slightly overlapping things. So you have to think about where you're going to store the data uh, and how you're going to tie that together. So we, we use global IDs. What does that mean? Um, one of the applications we have is Salesforce. Salesforce generates global IDs for everything. Every single prefix, VRF, VLAN, customer, supplier, port, rack, everything every SFP so we have, we have a global ID for everything and in one system where we're storing um, 
customer orders, they all get the global ID. In another system where we store our config data, there's all global IDs. And so now our customer facing portal can basically use the same global ID to ask the different systems. So the customer portal can ask our config database for services related to this customer using the global ID. And it can ask the billing system for bills for this customer using the global ID. Um, so somehow you need to tie this stuff together. We use global IDs. It may not be the best for you, but you need to put some thought into it, basically. Um, the Lego bricks, this is from the previous screenshot I showed you. So I, I placed the IP transit order on my laptop. Um, it was a dual stack session. So what you got, you can just see here in the middle, there's a port. There's a VLAN, because I'm having this on like a tagged sub interface. And you've got two prefixes. fixes. So there's a V4 and a V6. It's two BGP sessions, V4 and V6. And you've got a billing and a setup. So a non-recurring charge and a monthly recurring charge, which are all zero euros. Why not? Um, so tech stack. So when to have a single application per role. So I mentioned earlier, we, you know, Greenfield, you want to try and keep your deployment, your, your, your tech stack small, have as few applications as possible to start with. Um, sounds good. There's a trade-off. Like everything in life, there's a trade-off. Um, so the fewer applications you have, the simpler your operation is. It's the same with routers, right? I said we can apply the same lessons from routers. What has scaled for me really well in the past is having a strict one service or one role per router. This router is only a root reflector. This router is only layer three VPNs. This router is only peering. This scales really well. I don't have to do software upgrades on my layer two VPN router because of some other feature that I'm you know, for a different customer on the same router. It scales really nicely, but now I have many, many more routers, which is operational overhead, and it costs a lot more money. The same applies to your application stack and your automation stack. If you go down the road of having strictly one application that does one thing and nothing else, you can scale it really nicely. You can just spin up more containers or VMs or whatever you do and just do horizontal scaling. Um, but now you have many, many more instances and you have to upgrade them all from time to time, software and hardware. Um, so you, this is a balance that you need to think about. Um, you need to consider your user base. So how technical are they? So we have guys who are hardcore programmers, we have guys who are hardcore networkers, and some guys in between. The guys who are hardcore programmers, um, it's very easy for them just to make a microservice or just make an application with an API, then you can use a JSON web token to authenticate it and do whatever you want. And people who are not technical or not programmers do not like to use APIs. They are not user-friendly at all. If you have to explain to a non-technical person what a JSON web token is and how do you get one, you know, that's already a bad start. Um, so try to reduce try to reduce your lock-in. Again, this is kind of typical network network lessons. You do the same with your network equipment and with your network vendors already. You try to reduce your technical debt. Um, so there are some great tools that I think almost everybody knows about in networking, things like Ansible or Netbox, they're just pretty much industry standard. But there's, there's a price to pay. Uh, Netbox is great. It has a really great web interface that non-technical people can log into and just do a few clicks. Now I've got a router and an IP address. Great, 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 great. Um, the more features you use in Netbox or in any tool, I shouldn't, be, shouldn't blame Netbox, the more features you use in any tool, the harder it will ever be to migrate away from that tool. So at some point in the future, you know, you, none of us control Netbox. If they remove a feature that you really depend on, um, this is going to be a big problem. So you but if you only use one single feature of Netbox, it will be much easier to kind of migrate away from it, right? The same applies to Ansible or any other technology. Um, so yeah, examples that we may be familiar with are things like Netbox and Ansible and Ginger 2. Um, so this is pretty much my vision of Netbox, basically. It's like the Excel of networking. And I, we use Netbox, but I, that doesn't mean I like it. I really don't like it. Um, so just uh, anecdotally, just yesterday I discovered that VRF IDs, the root distinguisher, is a string. So you can have a VRF that's got the root distinguisher zero, and zero, zero, and zero, zero, zero. There are three VRFs. Um, if you push that to the network, that won't work because they'll all come just down to one, the same integer. I hate netbox. Uh, you can ask me afterwards, I've got loads of stories like that. Um, so, But it's easy to deploy, it's easy to use, and it's easy to integrate. So it's easy to kind of badmouth Netbox or Ansible or Ginger 2, but there's a huge gain. If your user base, so your colleagues and stuff, are not so 
fluid in programming and technical stuff, it's really great. You, so you have to kind of, you have to weigh it up, right? It does create massive technical debt too. Okay, this is a very, I'll do a very quick overview of our stack to then show some more examples. Um, so I won't go into it too much. If it's too quick, you can just kind of ask me afterwards. Um, but we have a web portal, an API that customers interact with. You want to place an order or cancel an order? Never. Um, they hit a back end. If you're a new customer, the back end will create the customer in our ERP system. <coughs> and then any for anything else, adding, deleting, editing orders, you hit a central unit called Cortex that we wrote. This is an asynchronous task processor with the REST API in front. So you hit the API, you ask it to, I want a new IP transit service. That goes into a queue, a worker picks the job out of the queue and does the job. And then we'll sort of later on respond back with the results of the job. And Cortex has to fan out to all the systems below and, and do all the things that need to be done to make a, like an IP transit service work. Um, so I said, we down at the bottom here, we have, we have ERP, CRMs, lowers. So if you place an IP transit with order with us, we just automatically generate and return a lower PDF straight into the portal. And we do all our CO2 tracking. I said earlier about we want to be sustainable. This needs to be automated with our customer facing stuff, but also with our suppliers. Where every time we add a supplier or place an order, we need to track the CO2 for it. So it must be automated. We wrote our own IRR API so that we can kind of more programmatically pull in prefix lists. We interact with peering DB, DSIM and IPAN as this netbox so we can reserve ports and rack space and stuff. Um, and what we end up is with a service and all its data being in Netbox. And then the, m the long list of problems with Netbox also includes the fact that in the background, it's a Postgres database, which is nice. We can spin up more replicas. We will have Netbox, or we'd be planning to have Netbox running in multiple regions around the world. We can have m multi masters and this kind of stuff. That's really great. It has no version control. It has no rollback ability. You can't just click a button in the, in the GUI and roll the whole thing back to last week before, before you triggered some bug, right? So it does have a REST API and a web GUI, which is great. Um, so, but it, you know, these are like, it has some of the things that you may want, but some of the things you don't want. So we have another tool that says config versioning and validation. So you put, we push the order into Netbox, and then we create a lock on Netbox. No one can edit Netbox. We have another tool that then basically reads the Postgres database dumps the whole thing out, pulls all the data out of Netbox, runs it through a Jinja 2 validation schema to check that the data in there is correct, so we're not, we don't have devices with no IP addresses or something like that. Validate all the data, and when we dump it out in two formats, YAML and JSON, then they get pushed into Git. So now we have the whole config validated, version controlled, sitting in Git, and then any tool that anyone writes can just pull the Git repo, consume the data, it's been validated, and it's in multiple formats and stuff. So the, the last thing we have on the end templates and deployments is another API we wrote. It's a wrapper around Ansible. Pulls the Git repo, uses the data to um, hydrate the templates, pushes out to the network with, with Ansible. So that's the kind of overall work stack. But there's something wrong with this picture. And I wonder if anybody knows what, that or there's a problem with this picture. And I wonder if anyone knows what it is. I mentioned it already. And the clue is the links between the blocks. Can anyone get? No, th we're happy with that because, like Cortex, we want that. We want one thing that implements our, that enforces the so Cortex. Something else it does is a business, what we call business process flow. So if one thing fails, it will rerun it and kind of make sure it completes and stuff. Well, that is a problem, <laughs> but it's not the problem. Boink. Every single one. So Cortex manages that, but the problem is every single one of these things is an API. It's terrible for debugging, it's terrible for human interaction, it's terrible for testing, it's difficult, it's awkward, people don't like not having a GUI. Um, how, how do you convince not people who are not very technical, like really technical, to get on board with this stuff? How do you show them how to troubleshoot it? How do you convince them this is the right way to go if they can't see it? Because API is application to application. There's nothing human in there. How do you do your um, like monitoring and troubleshooting when there's a problem? How do you get alerts from this? People who are used to working with network kit, getting your SNMP traps and stuff. Now what do you get from this? Nothing. 
So there's a, there's, a, there's a whole thing you need to think about when you're doing your automation stack that this is actually, this is cool, but this is also a problem. I hope that makes sense. Um, so we had to kind of backtrack. Uh, we use a system called Sentry. We had to backtrack and then add in Sentry. So Sentry, uh, when applications go wrong, they throw an exception. Sentry collects the exceptions from all the applications and puts it in a lovely GUI for us, and we can filter them and assign them to people and stuff like that. Um, but it was missing, right? That's something that we missed. We just thought we'd build this cool stack, and that would be great. So coding. If you get when, so once you've kind of done your data modeling, decided on your tech stack, you know, built, decided what Lego bricks you need, you're going to actually burn up the plastic. Um, then you actually need to agree on a framework. So if you are new to coding, just like you would in networking, you would. So if you were networking, you would say have some standard config templates for how you do a BGP session, how you do uh, a VXLAN, how do you do an interface. You kind of need to do the same thing with coding. You need to discuss how are we going to write our code and what will it look like and will we use classes and will it be object orientated and will there be methods and functions and will there be inheritance? And it's a bit like the data modeling. Um, you have to kind of take one step backwards, but it's two steps forwards. So it is ultimately better, but you have to stop. You need the time to stop and think about it. Um, and what are some sensible defaults? So when the customer um, doesn't fill a field in, in the portal, what should we do with that? And how should we interpret that? And if some data is missing in Netbox, because a Netbox is crap and anyone can just log in and do whatever they like, what will we do about that? Um, so you need to think about defaults and what it means when something's not defined. There are there are tools that you can use to to help you on this journey. So Python's incredibly common for networking people and Go. So if you use Python, there's stuff like PyLint and Black and iSort. And if you use Ginger2, there's J2Lint and there's Ansible Lint and there's pretty much anything Lint. Um, so you know there are tools you can use to kind of help you get started with those things. Um, and what we started doing was what we call non-blocking merge requests. So you have some information that's stored in somewhere like GitLab or GitHub or Jenkins or wherever the hell you put your stuff. And people open what we call a pull request, which means they don't just overwrite your data directly, but they actually make a request to merge their changes into your work and somebody reviews it. Yeah, So you can see what's going to be changed. Um, and there are different ways you can do that. One way you can do that is what we call blocking. You cannot merge your changes into my work until it has been reviewed. So for example, um, our Ansible plays, you, you place an order in a portal, um, they will get triggered automatically by the API that we wrapped around Ansible, right? So if someone makes a breaking change to our Ansible plays, that's very bad because now we've lost our real-time provisioning. So if you're going to make a change to our the repo that holds our Ansible plays, then that kind of needs to be a blocking uh, pull request, right? You need to make sure that that's valid somehow. But if you just go from zero to blocking, you'll make people really angry. Um, and there are also other issues like what do you do when everything's on fire? You want to just push changes. You want to commit straight to main, right? You want to YOLO commit and just make the changes. But there's a people aspect if you just implement what, what I call blocking merge requests, then you're just going to annoy everybody. People who are not used to that method of wa working and thinking. You So you kind of have to, we, so at the minute you have to kind of make a merge request, a bunch of tests run, but you can still commit because maybe everything's on fire and you need to commit a fix. But then after some time, people get used to that and they get better at making the changes and they submit changes that have no mistakes in them. And then once you get to this point, you can kind of turn the key and lock it and go, okay, from now on, blocking merge requests. Everything has to be approved and validated and so on. But there's a there's a people process you have to manage. Um, okay, testing. So I just kind of alluded to testing a bit. Um, so if you're not familiar with automation and programming and coding, then there is something that are called unit tests. Unit test is where we take the smallest piece of code that you've written, we write a small test, and we test that it does, does what we think it would do. We run this piece of code, was the result what we expected? Um, sounds kind of meaningless to test every little piece of code. But as you build up your code, you're writing more and more functions as you build up over time, you end up with uh, function A that calls function B, and that calls function C, and that calls function D. And at some point, you're calling function A and it doesn't work anymore. And the problem is somewhere along this chain, and you have to find the problem in the chain. And so this is one of the reasons that we use unit tests. So we know as soon as something breaks, 
where it is in the chain, what broke, and most importantly, who broke it. Um, so it's strongly recommended. So in, if you're coming from a pure networking background, this is not something that networking people are used to. The only way you can test something in networking is just to like log, on, log, you just log on to a lab router and just try it out, just start typing in the lab. Oh, does this work? No, okay, that doesn't work. Just uh, recommit, yeah, roll back, mm -hmm, no, okay. And you trial and error and work it out, um, which is fine if you have a lab. <laughs> not everyone does have a lab. Uh, but also, you know, if even if you do have a lab, doesn't mean it's going to work in production. That's another great problem that everybody faces. Um, and so, with unit tests, what we do is we split. We've in software, you can break the problem down. You don't have to have this kind of big bang, all or nothing approach like you do in networking, where I'm going to apply some conflict to this router, and it's either going to crash or it's going to work brilliantly. I'm going to make a very small change to the code, and apply a unit test to it, check that nothing happens, and keep building on this. Um, I mentioned CI pipelines to help automate the testing. This is what I was talking about kind of with pull requests and merge requests earlier. If you're not familiar with this stuff, you know, so you want to merge some changes into the work I did. The CI pipeline, it means we can have some automated tests that check that your work is not going to break anything when we merge it in, or my, my work's not going to break. And a test coverage is a never-ending story, so you need to work out what's reasonable for you. It's just the same as like with, net with actual networking equipment. Um, when you do, a s when you are testing a new software version for your really expensive router, you know, in previous, in a previous company I worked at, um, it would take three months to do a full software check on on, on a BNG. So we were doing broadband subscriber stuff. So yeah, software update on a BNG. That's full. That's one guy full time, three months to test do a full software test, um, which is crazy. Um, but we had millions of customers, and so we would kind of. It it, it paid off, right? But it, that's that's kind of very extreme. You want to that's unreasonable to start straight at this point. You can start by just making some small tests and then building up over time. Um, okay, so la this is the very last slide, uh, and then we're done. Um, so write human-friendly error messages. Again, we started coding, and we were all very happy with the code that we were writing, and it was working really well, and we just couldn't believe how good we were, and we just thought we should just retire soon. Uh, then other people started using our code, and they were like, what the hell does this error mean? What are you smoking? And then we realized, that, oh, yes, we have to go back and actually add loads of error messages, debug messages, into our code to actually make it clear to non-technical people or people who are just not familiar. Even the guys who are much better programmers than me, they've never seen this code base before. They've got no idea what the error means. So you, you have to think of other people, right? Just the same as you do in networking. You know, we spent hours, days, weeks discussing interface descriptions. So we have this massive interface description that describes my whole life story. But now when you look at the interface, you know exactly what is happening. Right. Um, write some tools to help you debug your situation. Um, if you've got something specific to your company happening in your automation stack, you can write a tool to fix it. So I mentioned earlier this central unit we have called Cortex, which runs all oversees all of our jobs. It's this asynchronous task processor. So you just make a call to Cortex, puts a job in the queue, and then a worker comes along, picks the job up, and does the job. So wh all you get back in response is job ID, and that's it. So after not very much time, I quickly needed a tool that would then actually get the job ID and keep checking when the job is finished and tell me when the job is finished, right? So you kind of have to think about um, how are you going to debug these problems? Yeah, create a simula simulation environment. I mentioned that already. I know it sounds obvious, but um, it's actually quite difficult. Some people I mentioned, sort of jokingly mentioned, that some people don't have a, a lab network to test software upgrades and stuff like this. It's easier to do that with just pure software. You can just spin up Docker containers and virtual machines, and you, know, you can get a VM from OVH for like 50p or 50 cents. I'm British. Um, but it w still will not be the same as production. You know, the 50, the 50 cents or one euro VM won't have all your production data in it and the same amount of usage as production and all that kind of stuff. So it is still hard and you need to put some time into thinking about how you will achieve this. And the last thing I want to say is fail safe. Um, so we put, put a, sort of a reasonable amount of time thinking about how we will fail safe. So if you place an order in the system, for example, and somewhere along this chain of events something goes wrong, um, the first thing we do is lock, we lock all the components. The job goes through, does all its things, unlocks the components. 
Um, if at some point the job fails, it can just restart and go again. And we also designed all our APIs to be idempotent, which if you don't know what that means, it just means calling the same function a second time is not a problem. If I try and create this BGP session and it already exists, it's fine. It doesn't create two by accident. Right, so we make everything idempotent and we can retry our jobs, no worries. But if the jobs, after like n number of retries, there's something really wrong, the job will fail, alert a human, the lock stays in place. There's a problem and we need a human to come and do it. And so we would rather just back up the orders and have a backlog than just kind of pushing out bad config to our network or something like that. So you need to think about having some um, fail-safe mechanisms in there. We're using Ansible because this is really good. A lot of network engineers know and love Ansible, and it's quick to get started, quick to get developing and stuff. Um, but Ansible is terrible. It's as bad as NetBox. Um, so what's really great about Ansible is that unless you specify otherwise, it will whatever your play does will apply to all devices by default, and it will run all tasks by default. So if you don't apply a limit or, a, or any, any task tags, you, you apply everything to everything. That's the default mode of Ansible, which is about as bad as it gets. So we reworked our place so that if you run a play and you don't specify any hosts, it quits. If you don't specify any tags, it quits. You must specify what you want to happen and to whom or to what it will happen. Uh, and I think that's it. Yes, so I think I went a bit over time and so sorry about that. And Any questions? Uh, yeah, I think it perhaps depends on the vendor. We had this discussion earlier because our vendor's in the room. <laughs> uh, so we, I can expand on it a bit. So okay, we're using Ansible um, and we're using Arista and Arista have an Ansible role. The Ansible role they provide is actually not specific to full config or partial config. You, have, you can kind of do both things, but we actually do do full config. So we always generate, a f so we do that separate from Ansible. So we have Ginger 2 templates. Um, we feed them all the data that was exported from NetBox into Git, that structured and validated data. We feed that into Ginger 2 templates, and that generates a full device config. And then we have Ansible uh, do a full device config push. Every time we push, it's a full replace. Yeah. Any other questions? That's right, so we basically, Cortex creates a lock so that no one else can update NetBox. Uh, we then start our exporter, so it reads from actually directly from the NetBox Postgres database. So read the whole database out. We use JSON schemas to validate what's in there, so we check that there aren't devices with no IP addresses configured somehow or something, some mistake. So we kind of validate all that data, and then we spit it out in two formats, YAML and JSON, and those get committed into a Git repo. So then there's a Git repo, anyone can just pull the repo and you've got the config data validated and in two different formats so you can write your own tools and do whatever you want basically. Yeah. yeah, it's a few so there's a few things. I I tried to explain it earlier, but I think I did a bad job of it. Um so I, I sort of said one of the many bad things about Netbox um is that it's got this Postgres database behind it. So it has many good things. The web interface is easy to use, the API is easy to use. Side note, if you use PyNetbox, which is like a third party module, total crap. Um, so but the, so NetBox has got this web interface and uh, REST API, which is good, easy to use, it stores everything in this Postgres database behind it. The, there are several problems with that. Well, there are some good things and there are some bad things. The bad things are no change log. There are actually a changelog for some things in NetBox. It does give you a, a changelog for some things, but not everything. Um, in particular, if you delete something. If you, so if you modify something, it tends to keep a changelog. If you delete it, there's no changelog because the changelog was like attached to that thing you've deleted. Things gone, changelog gone. So it has like it doesn't have um, that um, version history. It only has it for some things, not all things. Even the things it has, it's not very good. So we, that's one thing we're missing is that kind of, we want to see all the changes, when they were made, by whom. We also want the ability to roll back our network config in time. So if something does get into NetBox, 
we export it out and then eventually push it to the net to the network and there's our problem because we've got this intermediary step with git not only can we see what changed when by whom fire them then after that um, we can actually um, roll back our git repo and then repush the last good config to the network exactly yeah Yeah, the other, th the other thing is uh, that I mentioned is that this gives anyone else can consume the data. You just pull the Git repo and you've got it in two different formats and you can so you can write other tools and stuff like that. And it, it's also that data that's been exported has been validated. So we do actually write, we have a bunch, we've written some custom validators in Netbox. So they're like plugins that kind of run in Netbox. So even when you're in the GUI, um, if you try to add a BGP session manually, because um, we're still developing Cortex, right? So it's the, the kind of automation platform still being developed. So some things you still need to do it manually in Netbox. If you're in there and you try to add um, uh, a BGP session in our, um, so we have a DFC in a VRF. If you try to add a BGP session in our DFC VRF using two private AS numbers, the custom validators will kick in and dis disallow that. You can't have BGP sessions on the internet with private AS numbers, right? So that we s have still have some validation in Netbox, but it's just not very good. So we, we when we export it, that's the chance to really do it. Uh, good question. So there's two parts to that. The first one is Ansible Vault. If you're familiar with Ansible Vault, and if anyone's not, um, you can encrypt secrets with like AES two five six encryption, um, and then the, that password can live somewhere else that our Ansible host can pull that password. Uh, so for example, if you have a BGP session and there's a password on the BGP session, we will encrypt the password with our Ansible vault key. The encrypted form of the password lives in Netbox. So that goes through the export cycle and ends up in our Ginger 2 templates. At this point, the Ansible host pulls the key, decrypts it. So the Ginger, the Ginger 2 template is hydrated with the actual password and then pushed out to the device. There's a second part to that as well, which is that everything we have is running in Kubernetes. So if anyone is or is not familiar with Kubernetes, we use sealed secrets. And that is basically the Kubernetes cluster itself. Um, it has, has a public and private certificate, just like on HTTPS systems. So we use the public key to encrypt secrets. They can then live in our Git repos. N they're encrypted. No one can read them if they manage to break into our Git repos. When the code is pulled to our Kubernetes stack, the Kubernetes stack can decrypt it with the private key it's got. Any more questions? Yeah? How about this is also for the other service itself? Not you've got it with the branded and so on. So how about other service? Good question. There's a there's a there's a okay, th yeah, two answers. The we've only done IP transit so far and we're now working on IP access, so we've got two services. So I can't really answer your question properly, to be honest. I can't give you a proper honest answer. Um, but my expectation is kind of not very difficult. So we're also going to be working on layer 2 VPNs and layer 3 VPNs. And a layer 3 VPN is a pool and a VLAN and a prefix and a BGP session and a VRF. Um, it's got one extra component sort of thing. So the expectation is, is not very difficult. But the honest answer is don't know yet. Good question. So we actually are planning to have just spin up multiple. So that's the whole stack I showed you. Spin up multiple instances of the whole stack. Um, so we'll actually have multiple of those running in different regions around the world. So we've only got one region right now, which is Europe, because we're now building out our network in Europe. But then we're going to North America and to Asia. So we'll spin up a, a stack in each region. Um, each one can operate independently then. And how do you see the Netbox improve then? Postgres. So there are some good things about, about having a proper database, which is you can have replicas. Um, but there are some bad things about having databases as well, like yeah, no rollback. Yeah, to his, to his local instance. And the only customers on there are, say, American customers. And then, say, in Europe, the only people on the European cluster might be European customers. So the data they're editing in Europe is not the same data that's kind of being consumed by these guys. How do you ensure that? Um, a sales problem. Thank <laughs> you.
it's a, it's a good but it's a, yeah it's a good question that's the kind of plan just to be honest that's the plan we've got at the minute and we kind of have to see how it goes because what we also want is when the european net box is down for some reason it can still perform read-only actions from the american one so customers could at least log in see their service um, and do non um, what's the word i'm looking for they can do things that don't change their service like raise a support ticket right so we kind of the the English phrase is the poo the proof is in the pudding. Sorry. So the the, the locking is so we lock it, but it, it's one second. You know, if you want to push a BGP session in or allocate a prefix, it's so you, you know, it will create a lock, make it an editing change or a deleting change. So in add, edit, or delete, we need a lock. But again, we don't need a lock. Uh, and if you're just adding a BGP session, I mean, it's just half a second or one second. Or so until we get to the point where we have like hundreds of people ordering an IP transit second per minute, we'll just we, 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 we think we'll be all right. Uh, we can, there's also some horrors. Some sorry, there's some vertical scaling we can do, right? So. With NetBox, um, we can actually just increase the CPU power, the number of cores, the number of workers, um, and we can. We've also discussed we can maybe put memcache in there as well and stuff like that. But for now, it's just not a problem. Yeah, but it's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Yes, maybe we could do in the future, but it's like it's more of a. Um, what do we need right now? You know, this is the scale that is maybe 10 years away, kind of. But we have thought about it. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I'll be honest, so I failed. Uh, I tried to, what I thought would be a better idea is actually to do the locking in NetBox itself. So I wrote a plugin for NetBox, um, which is kind of a wrap. So you call that, which had its own little API. You call the API in the plugin, it will lock the Postgres database, and then just call the, what the actual NetBox function you want it. Create IP address or whatever, and then uh, get the result. Unlock the Postgres database and return the result back. Um, but it didn't work very well. You know, being honest, it didn't work very well. Um, but actually, there are some other places in our pipeline where we also need the lock to be held. So we moved it into this this central thing we have called Cortex. Anyway, it made more sense to be there. So because we don't just want to protect against yeah two people editing NetBox at the same time. Um, we also have other issues, or we may have other issues. So let's say, for example, we hit a bug on a router in production, we just want to stop deployment. So we just enable the lock in Cortex until we're ready to go again. Or w the thing is, we're not really, you know, who knows what the future holds? It's kind of hard to predict what issues you are going to. Uh, if I knew what issues we're gonna Im we were going to face, I'd be a, a billionaire. Um, so we just thought the best and kind of safest way to start is to move the lock into the center lock everything, and then show my mouth. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but maybe in like a couple of years, we'll come back and tell you this was a disaster, and we moved the lock back to NetBox, or maybe it worked great. Yeah, I mean, and this is what we we're thinking for for services like IP Transit and IP Access and Layer Two VPN. The volume is not going to get to that level, sadly. <laughs> yeah. Back to sales, though. <laughs> yeah, back to sales at the sitting at the back of the room. That's the target. Make sure that this our tech stack is not fast enough. <laughs> Correct, yeah, so we are working on DDoS scrubbing as well. Yes. So we are not expecting to have to put anything in NetBox for that. I mean, apart from what your service is, you know, who's got the, 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 the base service details, who has the service and what are your preferences for the service and so on. But the actual uh, our flow, like analytics and the decision-making, should be entirely outside of NetBox.
so that we don't see it being a problem. Yeah. Can I turn the microphone off? <laughs> uh, I I don't know what I can say to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so I showed you that picture earlier with all the Lego bricks. You do not get that on your bill. Uh, unless you actually, unless the, I think the, the things you paid for, like so we charge you for an IP version 4 address, it's going to be on the bill. You can't have a bill, you can't not have things on the bill that you're paying for. Yeah. yeah. It's perfectly possible, yeah. yeah. So this thing about Salesforce is that we, I think, have been through three consultancy companies. I don't know if you know, Max. I think three now. Four, I think we're on our fourth now. Um, and they told us also as well that I think we're the leading user of their CO2 module and we have to help, se we have to explain back to Salesforce how it works and stuff. So nothing but success. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean you you just put your uh, you just put your AS number in from peering DB. We pull your um, prefix limits and your AS set automatically. Not yet, but there are a couple of things we're working on. We're also working on, um, or we've got in the pipeline somewhere. Um, uh, what do you call it? So V4 over a V6 next hop. Yeah. So that's something that we've considered. It is sitting in a in a in our ticket system not moving anywhere <laughs> because we have to concentrate on launching the product and what we need are some customers to come knocking on the door and say yeah we need that we need somebody to come and drum up the interest and then we can say to management didn't we have a good idea when we created that ticket so better go on into dot link and place an order <laughs> uh, any more questions Cool. Thank you. Sorry I overran.